you ever try something that was so amazingly good, you had to have more? Happened here, right here in the show. We did a wonderful show with Suzanne Wayne. She had so many great things to say about her books. So much so that she never got to her brand new book. And today, that is exactly what we're going to talk about. My name is Vin DeQuino, and our guest, once again, is the great Suzanne Wayne. Oh, thank you. It's <laughs> great Suzanne, to be back. Let's talk writing. Sure. You have a whole new book that we never even had a chance to talk about the last time. And it's a wonderful book. So we do want to talk about it. It also has some amazing history in it. Mm -hmm. History that freaked me out. I mean, I had no idea. So let's, again, remind our audience who you are and what you do. Sure. I'm Suzanne Wayne. I write for children and young adults. Most of my career, that's what I've done, e either as an editor or as a writer. Most of my work has been at the older end of young adult in the last few years, though I do have uh, this middle grade series. And these are your younger. books up here at the top, but there's more even. There are more. Um, I brought these along because they are on a timeline of how I got to, to write that book. I've written, I started with reincarnation in terms of my books. It's not my first book, but my first book that dealt with history. Ah. And that's about a couple who travel through time, always missing each other, then getting together, then missing each wow. other. So it's a love story, but over many sort lifetimes. Sort of a historical love story. <laughs> it is. Well, it's many historical <laughs> periods. There's a lot of research. Wow. Uh, and then I wrote Distant Waves, which was uh, partly about the Titanic and partly about uh, the world of spiritualists that was going on at the same time. And uh, they, they sort of intersected, but the first 200 pages of that book is, is about mysticism and spirituality wow. and the, the spirits. And then I wrote Invisible World, which was about the Salem witch trials. And it's also, I took the premise that there was something going on, that there, yeah. there wasn't all just craziness, that there was yeah. something floating really around. there's really something there. Evil. And I took a lot of it from the transcripts of the trial, wow. which are very scary oh, in, on their imagine. own. Uh, talking about talking devil dogs, not the not the yeah. fruits, not the snack. <laughs> oh, no chocolate. Yeah, no. No, black, this black dog that you know, the, the devil speaks through. Ugh. And this is just not my imagination. Yeah. This is in the transcript. So um, Scholastic is my primary publisher right now, and they, since I was starting to kind of build up a, a certain type of book, right? They asked me to do that for the French Revolution. Wow. Which and that's the faces that is, um, of the dead. And uh, the, I found the French Revolution was hard to get a hold of. It's, it goes on for a long time. It's yeah. not like the American Revolution with the straight timeline. It goes, they go to different palaces at different times. They're, um, all, it, it goes on for a very long time. It's it just it was hard for me. I had to do a lot of research yeah. to get You know, the people foundation. don't realize that fiction takes as much research as nonfiction sometimes. Oh, it does, yeah. Because there's so much that you have to put in there. Mm -hmm. So you actually had to do a study of the French Revolution. Had you any knowledge of it before I that? had only the most general mo knowledge that you, yeah. you have, that you the know king and the queen were too lavish and the people got annoyed and or enraged, and they, they cut off their heads. I mean, that's what yeah, I knew. they really did cut off their heads. Uh-huh, they <laughs> really did. Uh, and... So I had to kind of pinpoint where they were when, though, and that that took uh, that took me in a bad direction with the writing of this book because I got oh. so wrapped up. Yeah. In that historical, that the story was sort of it was getting confused. I was trying to do it in flashbacks. I, it was difficult. But luckily, I have a great editor at Scholastic, Erin Black, and she helped me strip it down for the first draft and take away a yeah, lot of the... Yeah, some of the things that you didn't need. That How needed. did you finally decide the main character? Hmm. I decided uh, someone who was about the age of my reader. Oh, the good idea. Uh, someone that, that the reader could relate to as, 
as a, a con, you know as a peer in a sense and put themselves in the place and it was Marie Therese Charlotte who, who was the royal oldest daughter of Marie Antoinette and Louis the uh. 16th well, oh okay that's uh, uh <laughs> Marie Antoinette fooling around you know <laughs> spirits <laughs> gotta get their say you know? <laughs> uh, because maybe she would object to what I was about to, about to say, which oh. was that Louis the Sixteenth. there was a girl in the palace that she, whose name was also Marie Therese. Every second person in Paris, girl in Paris was named Marie Therese at that time. <laughs> so they all took other names to kind of... <laughs> yeah, that could be confusing. So the second Marie Therese who was in the palace, uh, Marie Antoinette, and this is all true, nicknamed uh, Ernestine after a character in her one of her novels she was reading mm. and Ernestine was six months older than Marie Therese the official child of France they called her and she was probably an illegitimate child wow. of um, King Louis the sixteenth and a chambermaid and so she was born six months ahead of Marie Antoinette's daughter but they were pretty, um, maybe they were used to all this royal hanky-panky, but they were yeah. pretty open about it. They let this child come into the palace. Knew, yeah. She had an allowance every year. Wow. Her mother and father were, like, promoted up in their yeah. ranks. The father, I think, was in the military. He probably got promoted up and out. But <laughs> yeah, really. But... Um, but Marie Therese Charlotte, the, the princess, and Ernestine became very close friends. They went to class together. They did everything together. So it's sort of a prince and the pauper situation yeah, yeah. in real life. Wow, wow. There are those who say it's not so. It's a, you know, probably not something they want to talk about in the official books. But there, there are a lot of... Um, documentation that she had a pension and she had money put wow. aside for her and everything. So that was one thing I came across. And then the other thing I learned was that the woman we now call Madame Tussauds and the woman we now call uh, Josephine, of Napoleon and Josephine, were in prison together at wow. the very beginning of the revolution. So they actually knew each other. They knew each other. The prison wasn't that vast, you yeah. know. They knew each other in prison. And in my book, I call them by the names they were known as at that time, which is Madame Tussaud, who later took the married name Tussaud, was called Anna Maria Groschaltz, and she was Alsatian. Wow. And she worked at the palace teaching waxworks to wow. the king's sister. Uh, and uh, Josephine, I can always have trouble, <laughs> Boharnais, ah. uh, was named Boharnais, but she was married to an aristocrat named, she was from, um, uh, oh, it'll come back, she was one of the Caribbean islands. Right. Uh, and she married Boharnais, and then she went to prison with him for being an aristocrat. So, Martinique, wow. she was from Martinique. Wow. And so they knew each other. And I thought those two things, there's a story. So now you took two that, story lines. the actual historical facts, mm -hmm. and you wove them into... The Faces of the Dead. Yeah. So tell me about The Faces of the Dead. Very interesting title. This was not your original title, though. Uh, no, I, I wanted to call it The Wax Face. The Wax Face. Face. Because yeah, why? because of the Madame Tussauds oh, connection, the waxworks, and she there was a Dr. Curtius's waxworks at the time, and she she I'm sort of guessing she might have been the child of the Dr. Curtius because he took her on as her mother was a chambermaid, and he took oh. her on as a, a student of waxworks and sort of had her working with him and teaching her all about. Dr. Curtius was teaching her about the Wax Museum, and, and so... Um, so this is a curious mix of the what is and the what if? It is absolutely that. It's the, what, that's what I do with my books. I, I take them and I spin them, the yeah, what sure. if. Yeah, sure, spin uh, them the way you think they might have gone. Uh-huh, I always write a gone. note at the back of all my books saying what is my speculation <laughs> yep. and what is yeah. documented fact and 
I, I toyed a little with the ages of Marie, Marie Therese and Ernestine just to make them in the middle of, they were younger when the French Revolution mm -hmm. really happened, so I, I pumped their, their ages up a little. So without giving away the ending, uh, give us an idea, give us a little synopsis of what happens in this book. All right. <laughs> in this book, Marie Therese wants to get out of the palace. She's hearing all these rumblings. She can't believe her father and mother are so irresponsible. She wants to get out there and see for herself. So she's witches places. Uh, and then the revolution is going along and she gets caught outside the palace. Whoa. And she meets this boy, Henri, who, Henri, who is her love interest. And they got a job with, uh, he's already working for the Dr. Courteous' Waxworks. And, and so she p gets to play both parts. She sees the royal part. She sees the poverty. I try very hard to be balanced because yeah. I went in thinking the queen and the king were awful. But as I did my research, I started to like them. <laughs> yeah, oh, interesting. <laughs> I thought they got a bad rap and they were just really the pawns of history because they weren't the most extravagant of the royals. Right. I mean, Louis And this the is king... This is Louis the Sixteenth, but the Fifteenth and the Fourteenth were way more abusive and yeah. lavish. I mean, wow. the Fourteenth built Versailles for himself. I mean, Versailles. I've been to Versailles. Versailles <laughs> yeah. is mind-boggling. Yeah. Uh, and and so they didn't really build that much. I, if they had acted faster, they might have lived. Wow. They, they saw all this was brewing. They were trying to give away more bread, more flour, but they were still they were still abusive. It, yeah. Um, and, and the people don't come off so great either. They, yeah. uh, we really, our American Revolution, I have to say, we should be proud because even with all the fighting and killing, it's nothing like Word the bloodbath that, yeah. that, that happened here. It was awful. They were in the palace. The people were storming the palace. They were running up wow. into the Marie Antoinette's bedroom and ripping up her quilts and things. Wow. I mean, until I started to get into it, I had really no idea. No idea that it was yeah. as brutal as, as it really was. Yeah, so what happened is uh, when they, Marie Grisholtz, Madame Tussaud, gets out of prison, and this is true, because they want her to make the wax faces of the royals as they're getting guillotined, oh. the death masks oh and God. the heads. At one point they went around parading her, one of her wax figures, the heads of the king and queen on spikes. Oh my and God. so I have my character seeing this in the street yeah. as, as a, a yeah. pauper child at that point. And, uh, but then is where it gets spooky is that... Um, I suppose, and I don't know this, this is now in the supposed area that... You were back in the if. <laughs> that back in the if, that Josephine Rose Berhanais came from Martinique with some voodoo kinds of knowledge. Ah. And then they start fooling around with capturing the spirits from the guillotine in the wax figures. Oh, wow. So Henri and Ernestine slash princess are out on the street and they see um, Julius Caesar from the waxworks sort of walking down the street because they're... Is that where we get faces of, of the, the dead? dead? Yes. Oh, because, interesting. Because they're working at night on in, sort of bringing the energy of the dead yeah. into the waxwork till they can hold it to get it into another person who's died. So, wow. so there's this whole moving, and I realize moving around of spirits is a theme that I have going. Yeah, this is, yeah. There, I mean, I, all of this. I, I'm into that too. You know, I got involved in the paranormal mm -hmm. and hauntings of the Hudson River Valley. And once you get in there, it's pretty hard to get out mm. because I really do believe you're amongst the spirits. Mm -hmm. I've said this so many times, dead people live here. Their spirits are all around us. And may not be easy to communicate, but somehow they manage to work their way into our books, don't they? With tremendous fascination. There wouldn't be the fascination there is for this stuff if people didn't all encounter it in different uh, yeah, and it's, ways. Yeah, and it does get encountered in many, many ways, and especially now here in this book. So, so this young couple... Uh, are involved in the waxworks, right? And bringing spirits into the figures. So, so eventually, well, without giving it away, I somehow out of this horrible French Revolution, <laughs> I have a happy ending. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> As only I could do. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, 
So it does. I, I love the cover. Uh, I love the whole idea of it being so intriguing. And these are the two daughters. That's our, uh, well, depending on which one they're being, that one of them yeah. is being the Princess Marie Therese and the other is um, Ernestine, the, the chambermaid's daughter. Now, in real history, there's a lot of speculation. Marie Therese was the only one who left uh, the jail and, wow. and lived through the whole thing. Wow. Uh, there was some speculation that the, the Dauphin lived and was exchanged, but they genetically tested the heart that they have of him, for him, and it's, it's him. So it they, is yeah, him. it is him. Wow. So, uh, but there's a lot of speculation that the girl who went on to be, and there was a attempt at counter revolution and a comeback and and all that. But the girl who left the prison and acted as the heir to the throne was in fact Ernestine. Wow. And that Marie Therese had been sick and maybe raped and like was not wow. a fit heir. So in fact Ernestine was really a Bourbon because she was the illegitimate child of wow. Louis Bourbon. Yeah. But uh, but in my book she just sort of hands it off to Ernestine. Says you want it, you take you it. Take I'm, it yeah. I'm going another direction. So it's a version of yeah. a conspiracy th uh, theory. They keep exhuming this body in Germany where, where people, there a woman, a countess, came into town and always wore a black veil and all this stuff, and you never get an answer as to what they found. Wow. They just keep reinterring her. All right, so let's go to the writing end of this book. Mm. Your publisher gives you a call, tells you that they would like a book on the French Revolution, and you say, okay. Uh, and you go to your local library, and there's all the information. Mm. Well, I read <laughs> I read Citizens by Simon Shama, okay. which is a voluminous, well-researched yep. novel. I also went a lot by pictures. I got a lot of pictures, and there were um, David was painting the Revolution, the death of Marat, and right, that kind of painting. Yeah. And then there was a woman who was a court painter. Also a great painter. Unfortunately, I can't remember her name. So there are a lot of paintings of so Marie Antoinette. So you captured Antoinette. the spirit of the time. I, I got, got a, a feel for I it. I got another book called What She Wore to the Revolution. It was all about Marie Antoinette's dresses and her hats. Yeah. And I'm a very visual writer, I feel. Yep, yep uh, me too. Uh, yeah, I, 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 am, I have to have a sense of the setting of my mm -hmm. books. So like for my books, when I was doing Kissed Candy Days, I went and spent time in the hospital uh, mm -hmm. so that I could actually see what this kid was going to see mm -hmm. when he was in the hospital. So I'm that same way. I, you know, Return of the Cicada, I went, strolled through the cemetery. Uh, I, I wanted a sense of where I was. And my head had to be there. So I could imagine you had to kind of place yourself in the revolution. I love the fact that you went to the paintings, which was brilliant mm -hmm. because it gives you a chance to see. Yes. And and I, I that would help me a great deal. Yeah, and there are a lot of paintings. It's a very well documented time in history. Yeah. There are records, yeah. there are bills, there are and paintings, lots and lots of paintings. So how long did that research take you? It took me longer than anything I've ever done, about a year. Wow, yeah. Uh, I went to Paris and wow. sort of got the sense of the Belgian blocks and the curved, narrow streets. And wow, and you go to the Wax Museum? I've been to the one in Manhattan and the one in London. Wow, um, wow. So that's another thing. Uh, so that, that itself was sort of inspiring because it's that strange, it's real and yet it's so stiff and yeah, stilted. Yeah, scary. It's, it's got that eerie tone and that's kind of, Good, because it gives you a chance to create a tone. You feel for your like book. there's someone almost trapped in there. Yeah. yeah and yet trapped. Yeah. 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 So. So, you, so you did a lot of research. Mm -hmm. So now, once you've done the research, do you write while you're researching, or do you do all of your researching and then sit down with your research? My time frames just don't let me do that. And, and also, you forget. I, I would forget the first thing I researched if I waited for all the research yeah, to be done. You couldn't do it, yeah. No, no. So as things occur to me, I write them down. I did several drafts of this book. Yeah. Um, and so the, the research, 
That helped me the most, though, was the visual research, the yeah. paintings. To be able to see what it was like at that time. I wrote this book in a different way than I've ever written a book before, which is first person present. Mm. Because I thought, what's really, at this point in history, we've all seen Les Mis, which isn't the French Revolution, it's afterwards, but we all have that, we know what we think we know. Yeah. So what is interesting, and I thought for a young reader, being there, it yeah. would be the most interesting. Yeah. Smelling the smells, looking, feeling the heart-pounding terror. You're right. On both sides. I mean, everybody was scared at this point. Yeah. You could get you could get guillotined for just saying, oh, "I'm indifferent to the revolution." That was that was enough to get you killed. Writers often ask me, uh, "Do you create an outline before you actually begin writing the story?" Do you? I do, uh, but it's loose, yeah. and I diverge from it often. I don't feel married to it. I don't feel yeah. like, oh, I said, in some chapters, I, when I make my outline, there's too much stuff in it, Other, yeah. so I have to make it two or three chapters. Others are too scant. You know, so the outline is a, a guide, uh, yeah. but it, it's I, I, I tell writers, always know your ending when you, yes. when you begin. I, I do want uh, but, that, too. Don't bet on getting there. <laughs> Just have it there. Mm -hmm. Have a sense of what your storyline is. Mm -hmm. And if it changes along the way, that's okay. But always have a goal. Mm -hmm. Always have a sense of where you're going. Absolutely. Otherwise, what happens is it begins to take its own route. Mm -hmm. And then pretty soon you're like, oh, my God, I have to sort all this out mm -hmm. because I don't need this and right. I don't need this. And this was if I went here. And that's what happens. It also allows you to plant uh, things that you're going to use later on. Exactly. I have a scene in here where she goes to a carnival and sees a thing, which was real, called La Belle Zulima. It was a, um, the beautiful uh, Zulima. And it's, it was billed as a woman who was dead for 200 years. But she's lying in a coffin and supposedly has an age. But well, there's a real woman just sitting in there. And that's the whole gimmick, but people come to see her. And at one time she just turns and winks at the princess, and the princess nearly jumps out of her skin. But she comes back later in, in the story. So in just in terms of them finding a dead body who was just anybody, it was more interesting if it was the, the Belle Zulima who she yeah. saw and who winked at her, you know? So you can plant, if you have an outline and you know where you're going, you right. can plant a lot of interesting things in, in if but you can't plant them if you don't know about them yet. Right, right. Wow. Uh, so, did you find yourself rewriting, going back to the beginning and making changes and deciding, you know, I better... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Every uh, book. Yeah. What I tell my writers, and it always kind of surprises them, I tell them never write the first page first. And they say, what? How can I not write the first page first? I say, write a first page. Write your book. And then now that you know how the story unfolds and where you really did go, not where you were going to go, but where you did go, now go back to page one with the knowledge of the rest of the book and now write a first page that's going to reflect the whole book. Well, that's great advice. Because you know how many, writer, how many readers do this? Mm -hmm. You lost them, mm -hmm. page one, and that happens. So I tell them, keep in mind that this is what a reader generally does. Looks at the front cover, reads the title, reads the back page, opens the book, and reads the first page. Mm -hmm. If you've kept the reader all that time, you're in good shape right. because so many readers are gone by the time they read the first page. That's really true. So, the cover, designed by them or you? Them. Them. Totally them. And this was totally them. They picked it. They decided that this is... Well, what, is that did all, you all like these it right titles? Now? All of these the same not, way? Yeah, all the same. They have an illustrator. They do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and the title, again, you had a different title. Right, I wanted to call it The Wax Face. The Wax Face. I thought that was good and creepy, but I think this is, I I've grown to like this, too. I have to say, I like this. Uh, and I like what they did with the cover. 
I took me, I had a warm up to that cover, but I like it now. It's, uh, like I said to you uh, earlier, this is a little Harlequin looking. For yeah, me. very Harlequin yeah, looking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Harlequin books do sell. well. Yeah, they do very well. <laughs> well, that's what this reincarnation cover, I hated this cover because I thought I had written a serious book and it looked so. Romantic. Romantic. Yes. And then my agent said to me, she goes, romance uh, section is not a bad place to be, Suzanne. <laughs> no, romance sells. This is a nice spooky cover. That's. Which one? Uh, Invisible, Invisible World. Invisible World, yeah. Uh, I like that. And that whole like that witch thing, first. it does have that, that sense. Uh, and Distant Waves, uh, mm -hmm. again, you didn't really have any input in the cover parts of these. No, no, and I wish I had because I like them. Yeah, but, uh -huh. uh, it was interesting. When I did Kiss the Candy Days Goodbye, this is the new cover. But the original cover, it has the four uh, main characters standing barefoot with their uh, pants rolled up. It's a scene from the book where he has a insulin reaction and he's on the river on the rocks in the middle of the river and they surround him as he takes a lifesaver to try to uh, react to this reaction. And they showed me a pencil drawing of it and I said, I love it. When they added the color, they forgot the river. Oh. So they're standing in the middle of the woods, barefoot, with their pants rolled oh, up. Oh. And people say to me, <laughs> why are they barefoot? And I, I say, never mind, you don't want to know. Well, it again has been a wonderful oh, treat having fast. you here. Oh, it's this great book to is be fascinating. A uh, lot of history, a lot of good romance, a lot of everything. Uh, you are a wonderful writer. You were a gift to us. Thanks. Uh, Keep on writing. Keep on doing what you do. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for joining in. Keep on doing what you do well. Thank you for being here on Let's Talk Writing.